we all know that guns are used uh, to coerce uh, people within all of the respective networks that we've been considering so far. It is a very complex trade, and to help guide us through it, there can be no better person than Robert Muga. Uh, Robert Muga was one of the co-founders of the Small Arms Survey. Uh, he is now a principal at SecDev Group. He is also the research director at the Igarape Foundation. How he finds the time to do all this, I have no idea. Uh, but he is, he is one of the best experts on the global arms trade in, in the world today. Um, before I relinquish the stage to him, I just wanted to take a moment to thank him to thank him not only for developing the presentation that we're going to see, to thank him not only for helping to organize the panel that he's going to moderate, but also for helping us secure the data, the underlying data, that we then use to develop the, impre the I think what you agree is the impressive visualization that we have up on the wall outside that he's going to also demonstrate for us here today. So without further ado, I'm introducing Robert Muga. Great. Um, well, first of all, what a tremendous opportunity to be here uh, to speak um, on this issue. And many thanks to, obviously, Google Ideas, um, uh, Tribeca, and, and the Council. Um, as many of you know, and it's been sort of a constant theme throughout this, uh, this, the sessions today, the arms trade is really the sharp edge or the sharp end of uh, illicit networks. Um, and whether featuring in film or on the battlefields, uh, weapons are about as ubiquitous as Google. Um, but there's nothing new about the arms trade, as all of you know. It's been central to statecraft and state failure uh, for centuries. And today I'm going to focus on the lowest end of the technological spectrum. Not weapons of mass destruction, not fighter jets or ships, but rather small arms, light weapons, and ammunition. After all, it's the guns, and not the latter things I just mentioned, uh, which are contributing to the vast majority of, of 20th and 21st century deaths uh, around the world. Uh, and a key point to mention here is that gun technology, unlike the technology we're talking about today, hasn't changed much in the last 100 years either. And about, after a, about a decade and a half of research that I've done in places like Bogota, uh, Jaffna, uh, Darfur, or, uh, Goma, what I found is that the majority of people around the world are being killed not by bombs, but by guns and bullets. So I'm going to talk a bit about the gun trade. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, the ecology, what I'll talk about, uh, describe as an ecosystem of the small arms trade, and then I'm going to talk about the transformation of violence, and we'll obviously turn to our presenters after that. So the small arms trade, I think, can be seen as something of an, of an ecosystem. It's a community composed of, of both living and non-living entities, and, and crucially, that interact in a system. They're the producers of weapons, parts, and components. They're governments that ship them between one another. They're the brokers and dealers. They're the cargo companies, offshore finance mechanisms, and the flags of convenience. And they're, of course, the end users, not always the ones that are intended to be the end users. The small arms ecosystem is fueled by one primary energy source, and it's not sunlight, it's cash. And like all ecosystems, this one's highly dynamic. It's subject to both external and internal triggers and disturbances. In other words, and this is perhaps my first and key point, we can disrupt it. The small arms uh, trade is often conceived, I think erroneously, in really binary or Manichaean terms. On the one hand, we got the white trade, and on the other hand, we got the black trade. The white trade is legal, it's authorized. It's, it's basically the transactions are supposed to be predictable, transparent, rules-based. On the other hand, you got the illegal trade, the black side. Transactions are secretive, unpredictable, operated by criminals, rebels, gangs, or terrorists. These are the bad guys we've been hearing about all day. But I think the key point I want to make is that the reality is often much more complex than this. The reality is, that the ecosystem spans a continuum, which we try to present here. The legal and the illegal ends are highly integrated. And in between that space is a gray area. The first point is that basically all weapons begin their lives legally. There are some exceptions. We've seen amazingly sophisticated knockoff assault rifles in places like Peshawar in Pakistan, or Chittagong Hill Tracks, or in Cotabato in the Philippines. But these are really small scale. The second point I want to mention about the continuum is, is, is that at some stage, either by default or design, a good number of small arms are diverted, they're leaked, they're trafficked. And this can happen at various points in the chain, either at the point of manufacture, it can, it can happen from the arsenals of militaries and police, it can happen during a supposedly legal, authorized transaction, 
It can happen at a retailer in, say, the U.S. It can happen during rival factions that are fighting, where weapons get seized. And it can even happen from being stolen from somebody's pillow. What I want to make, mention here is that there are about 100 countries and over 1,000 companies involved in producing small arms light weapons, parts and components and ammunition. The technological barriers to entry are incredibly low. Virtually all countries have some capacity to contribute to the small arms ecosystem, either as a producer, as an exporter, an importer, or a user. And obviously some countries, and these are the ones in orange, produce more than others. If you look at the world's top exporters of small arms and light weapons, in other words, those countries that produce more than, or export more than $100 million worth of weapons a year, the top of the scale is the United States, by a long shot. And for those of you who looked at the, 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 the tool outside, you would have seen that. But it's followed by Italy, Germany, Brazil, Austria, Japan, and so on. The world's top importers are often quite similar in terms of the countries. They include, again, the US, by a long shot, but also the United Kingdom, Saudi Arabia, Australia, Canada, and others. Just these countries that you've seen in orange account for about three quarters of all exports and imports. Despite the, the scale and diversity of the trade, the business of small arms and light weapons and ammunition is actually really modest by comparison to conventional weapons. The entire authorized trade is about $8.5 billion a year, of which about half, I'll get to this in a moment, is ammunition. To put this in perspective, this is less than 1% of US military, the US military budget in 2011. This is less than 0.5% of the entire conventional trade in arms. We think the illegal trade is probably about a billion dollars. So we're talking about something that's relatively small. So what's being traded? The, while the scale may be small, the trades actually increased over the last five to six years, slowing in 2010, 2011, owing to the financial crisis. And there's two points I want to mention about this particular slide. First, ammunition accounts for about half of the global arms trade. And this makes sense. Guns have long lives. Ammo doesn't. And without ammo, a gun's a stick. Second, small arms and light weapons amount to just over a quarter of the global annual trade. What's more worrying, and it's a side point, is that ammunition isn't something that governments really want to talk about. There's currently negotiations going on right now in New York to, to, to settle on an arms trade treaty, and ammunition is almost off the table. So I want to put that up front. So is the world awash with guns? Is there anything we can do about it? About 15 years ago, governments said this about landmines, anti-personal landmines. Today, after agreeing on a treaty to ban and remove them, we're almost in a landmine-free world. There are about 875 million small arms and light weapons in circulation, and this includes everything from handguns and pistols up to rocket-propelled grenade launchers and manned portable air defense systems. About a quarter of these, a quarter of that 875 million, are right here in the US. But I guess the point I want to make here is that while that seems like a big number, it's not an insurmountable problem. How are they distributed? Intriguingly, most of these weapons aren't actually held by governments at all. In other words, governments are far from having the monopoly on the use of force. Fully three quarters, about 650 million, are in civilian hands. Civilians in Afghanistan, Yemen, and the US are amongst the most heavily armed on the planet. Less than a quarter, about 200 million, are in the hands of military, are in military arsenals. And we think of that 200 million, about 75 million are surplus, in excess to what militaries need, ripe for being pilfered, leaked, et cetera. A tiny fraction, just 4%, 26 million are in the hands of policemen and women, and just under 1%, less than 8 million, are held by insurgents, rebels, terrorists, or others. So we're talking about a very, very small concentration in the hands of the so-called bad guys. And it's true, they do a lot of damage, but I'll, I'll make another point at the end of the presentation. Moving forward, transformation of violence. How are these guns contributing to the transformation of violence? The data I'm going to present here comes from a, a publication called The Global Burden of Armed Violence. Uh, which was produced by a number of uh, partners, including the World Health Organization, UNODC, and others. So, like the, the small arms ecosystem, armed violence is highly dynamic and widely distributed. After looking across all the countries in the world for which we had reasonably good time series data between 2004 and 2009, 2010, we established that the average violent death rate in the world was about seven per 100,000. Now, the spread between countries in terms of what the what the proportion of violent people dying from violence is, is quite large. In Japan, it's less than one per 100,000 people dying from violence. In a place like Honduras, it's 86 per 100,000. So you've got a huge spread between countries around the world. But the average, the baseline, is about seven. We found about 58 countries, you can't see them all, on the left-hand side, which basically are well above the global average. They're, they're 10 per 100,000 or above. And there are two concentrations, as you can see, with, with Russia as, uh, as another exception. 
primarily Latin America and Central and Southern Africa. Out of this, there are 15 countries that really stand out in terms of their violence. Only five of them can be described as at war. The rest, most of the top 10, are not. And again, most of these, uh, you can't really see the Central American cluster, but our cluster in Latin America, where about eight out of nine deaths are gun-related. And normally, uh, a, a nine-millimeter nine and not a 7.62 or 5.56 round. So fatalities are not the only way violence affects societies. We all know this. We talked about it all day today. There are many, many, many more people who are injured and displaced. Businesses shut down. We talked about investment drying up. Development ultimately is denied. But violent deaths are a pretty good proxy, and they're a good place to start focusing on when you think about intervention points. When we look at the big picture, what we see is about 10 times more people are dying every year, not in war zones, but outside of them. Countries like Brazil, Mexico, South Africa have more deaths per year from gun violence than most conflict-affected countries like Afghanistan, Syria, Sudan combined. This isn't to say that I, I want to focus on you know, not reducing armed violence or preventing armed violence in, in war zones. That's not the point, not at all. But I do want to stress that we need a really wide optic when talking about the small arms trade and its impacts. So I'm going to dive into the panel discussion um, since we, we have people here with real lived experience. Um, and basically, I'm going to, uh, first we're going, to, we're going to call out some of our panelist members to, to take a seat. The first person we have is Ian Biddle. Um, Ian Biddle has been involved in pretty much all aspects of small arms production and sales and destruction, and was in and out of the British military. Escorting Ian is Sylvia Longmire, who is a border control analyst uh, with the state of California and author of a new book called Cartel. And finally, you all know him because you saw him earlier this morning, is uh, Kella Sam, a former child soldier and now directing Hope, North Uganda. Now, conveniently, all of these people, all three, speak to various parts of this arms, we didn't plan this, the small arms ecosystem. Ian really has operated at the, at the cutting edge of the supply. Um, Sylvia focuses very much on transit, especially between US and Mexico, and Okello knows a lot about end use. And what I wanted to do now, if this will work, uh, is, is essentially introduce um, the mapping arms data set, um, or MAD data set, which you see right in front of us. For those of you who haven't seen this, this um, basically visualizes all reported authorized, and I want to make that point, authorized arms transfers between 1992 and 2010. So this is a legal trade, not the illegal trade. It's also based on state reporting to uh, the, the World Customs Union as well as a lot of cleaning on our part, and includes more than one million data points. So this is a relatively big data, I suppose. This is designed by Google, um, with support from the Igarapé Institute, but I also really, really need to acknowledge the extraordinary support of the, the Peace Research Institute in Oslo, PRIO, um, which very much was part and, of, and, and parcel of the development of the underlying data, um, and in particular, their small arms transfers program. We think this is a really major innovation transparency. Uh, this takes us from the dark ages to something like the Middle Ages, I suppose. Uh, and, and we think it's a real innovation in transparency, and we hope that this will contribute to the UN negotiations currently underway in New York. So I'm going to start um, a couple of questions with our, our colleagues who are here today. Um, and I'm going to start first again with you, as I, I spin this around. Um, and I zoom in. That's the US, by the way, United Kingdom. Um, Ian. Yeah. You, um, you've been involved in aspects of small arms and ammunition uh, exports from, from the UK for, for some years now. Uh, and I guess I'm curious, one of the key messages from the presentation is that a lot of the guns that we talk about end up getting diverted from being an authorized transfer, such as what we're seeing here in terms of the exports around the world uh, in 2008, 2009, uh, into the illegal side of, of things. How does the UK government authorize a deal in small arms and light weapons and ammunition? What are the checks and balances that are there to prevent this kind of diversion from taking place? Well, the key document is the end user certificate. This is a certificate produced by the, the buying country, the recipient country, to say they are going to be the end user of the weapon. Um, and before we, as dealers, can do anything, we need an end user certificate. This is presented to the UK government presuming that the country that's buying the weapons isn't on some sort of embargoed list or, and is approved of by the UK government. There's no internal repression or whatever else might cause the UK government to, to, to disapprove of a country. Um, it's, it then 
goes to the various ministries, to the Foreign Office, to DFID, the Department for International Development, um, and to the MOD to make sure that we're not going to be selling any sensitive technology, and assuming that we get approvals on all of those things. And this can no length, it's, it's quite a lengthy process. Um, then we will also need um, approval from the manufacturing country. It could be that we're supplying or we're brokering a deal for weapons made, I don't know, perhaps in the Balkans or, or in Europe to go to a con another country, perhaps in Africa. So the country of manufacture also has to approve the end user certificate. And that's, that's the basic check. Hmm. And where do, we, where do we find these end user certificates? Where do they come from? How do you get an end user certificate? Oh, you have to apply to the, generally they come from the country that, that, that puts in the order. I mean, the orders come in, perhaps they'll, uh, some countries will, will put in a shopping list once a year. Uh, combined military requirement is gonna be, I don't know, whatever it would happen to be. Um, and this will be given to an agent who will then slice it up and, and portion out parts of the shopping list to other firms. The firm I worked for used to specialize in small arms and light weapons. So we would receive portions of shopping lists from several countries from their agents. And we would then fulfill our proportion of it. And with that shopping list will come end user certificates from the country, from the, the defense ministry or whatever the Foreign Office. Occasionally, you could get it from the embassy of the country in UK, um, but but it it comes from the recipient. Okay, here's Mexico. Um, I'm going to include the imports from Mexico, um, and I'm going to zoom it in a little bit so you can see. Um, well, that's the US. I'll go back to Mexico. Um, Sylvia, Mexico is experienced, and I you can correct me if I'm wrong, but between 15 and 65,000 violent deaths. I keep hearing different numbers, yeah. perhaps you can correct us, uh, in the past six years. And, and an extraordinary number in a, in a country that actually experienced traditionally a, a decline nationally in, in homicide rates until around 2005, 2006. Most of these deaths are gun-related. I mean, many. Although we hear of the gruesome stories and they're often reported, I'd say the vast majority are, are gun-related. How are these guns and ammunition getting into Mexico? And that's the $64,000 question and, and what everybody wants to know on both sides of the border. Um, we know that there are tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands, of different types of firearms. Uh, assault weapons, rifles, pistols, revolvers. Uh, then you have military-grade weapons, Barrett 50 caliber rifles, uh, hand grenades that are floating all over Mexico that are being used by the drug cartels to kill each other, to kill um, Mexican army soldiers, to kill police. The problem is that only a small fraction of the guns that are out there on the street are seized annually by Mexican authorities. Out of that small fraction, only a small fraction of those are ever actually submitted to the American Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms and Explosives for tracing. Uh, so of those that are, so just to kind of give you a, a numbers perspective, uh, from 2000, roughly 2009 to 2011, uh, only 30,000 guns were submitted to the ATF for tracing out of an unknown number of guns that were actually seized by the Mexican authorities. Out of those 30,000 guns, roughly 70% of them were traced back to U.S. points of sale. Um, now, out of all the other guns that were not traced, that were untraceable because the serial numbers were uh, filed off, because they were uh, military grade and you can't buy them at a gun store here in the United States, uh, or they were put back into cartel hands, or there was something shady going on, we don't know where all those guns come from. That's the only estimate, that is the only resource for statistics that the U.S. government has to go on. Then on the other side, you have the, those military-grade weapons that are showing up. You have 20- and 30-year-old uh, rifles, uh, rocket-propelled grenades, rocket launchers, hand grenades that come from South Korea, uh, firearms coming from uh, Civil War remnants in El Salvador and in Honduras. It's really a, a mishmash. So you have, you know, and then you have uh, military-grade weapons that are coming from Mexican stocks. Um, Heckler and, and Cook, H&K, is one of the bigger suppliers of 
uh, firearms to the Mexican military. So some of those guns get diverted into the hands of the cartels. Some of the guns that are supplied to Mexican police end up in the hands of the cartels. So they're really coming from several different directions. Uh, the problem is, and there is no other country in the entire world where gun ownership is more politicized than it is in the United States. So answering that question of where do the guns in Mexico come from has a completely different context in this perspective of the drug war than uh, any other conflict in the world uh, because you have a, uh, a very strong pro-gun lobby that controls Congress like no other lobby group in the entire United States saying that, you know, that this is just a, a ploy by the U.S. government to take away all our guns and enact gun control legislation. Uh, and then on the other hand, you have the federal government saying, you know, ATF trace statistics tell us that the vast majority of guns in Mexico are coming from the United States, so we have to figure out how to stop the, the southbound flow of weapons. So, you know, not being Mexican and not living in Mexico, I can only uh, speculate as to the importance that the Mexican people put on exactly where the guns come from. I just know that they want them off the street and they want them to stop killing people. Um, but uh, that is just, it's a very complex question. We know they come from a lot of different places, but we will never know with any certainty exactly what proportion of firearms and explosives and, and military-grade weapons come from, from what parts of the world. Thanks, Sylvia. I want to now turn to um, Uganda, uh, which is in what we might describe as a bad neighborhood, um, circled by DRC to the west, Sudan to the north. Um, you've got Ethiopia to the northeast. You've got Kenya. You've got Burundi, Rwanda, all countries, barring some that, that have had sort of extraordinary conflicts or intense levels of violence in pastoral areas like the Karamoja, which I'm sure you'll talk about. But, but Okello, um, you, as a, you were an, a, formerly a, a, an involuntary member of the Lord's Resistance Army, the LRA, in northern Uganda. Um, and through that process, obviously, you witnessed a lot. Um, and I'd be curious to hear a little bit in, in some of your stories about how you understood the LRA, a, a classic, uh, in a way, armed group in, in a contemporary conflict sense how they procured their guns, how did they get their weapons? I mean, where do they come from? First of all, <clears throat> even before talking about the, the LRA or any other rebel group in the region, that you, just like you described it, any country where there has been a coup, there is presence of gun everywhere. So uh, the fact that there were you know, uh, military coups before the LRA, the fact that they were um, rebellions like uh, the one of the uh, defunct uh, Uganda National Liberation Front of the, the Holy Spirit movement, there was already a built stock of gun that is accessible to the LRA. So they were then, they, 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 there was then, uh, you know, no need to really look for guns because they were there. That is transferred. Then the other uh, uh, aspect, of course, of is the, the, the region itself. You have a lot of nomads who have guns in their hands, and uh, these nomads like uh, the Karamojong, like the Turukanas, are, are definitely always selling guns. So that's one way that the LRA acquired guns. And then, of course, the 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 I think the the the, the bigger component was from the Sudanese government, and so the Sudanese government then just brought in new guns, new uniforms bullets and everything and, you know, it, it took it as a responsibility of their government to supply uh, the rebels with guns and with space for training and, uh, and so that's, that's, that's that, I think that's, uh, and, and then of course when you have, when you have uh, an area like, like, like what you described where you have um, that some governments that have been, have challenged in monitoring even their military, then you have guns coming from generals who <laughs> are supposed to be fighting the LRA and they are, they are selling them. So you have, you have all these challenges going on. And I, I, I think that uh, until you, uh, there is a more organized you know, military in the whole region, that, that, that problem will, will, will continue. Hmm. Interesting. Yeah. It's worth adding that Sudan is under an arms embargo, uh, or has been relatively recently, but it only applies to Darfur. So legally, in fact, you can have authorized transfers to Sudan, but it's when they turn up in Western Sudan, in Darfur, that things become a little murky. And you can understand how difficult that is to police. Ian, 
a lot of yeah. stories are being told, uh, you know, and it's certainly in the popular media and in film, we talk about the nefarious broker, uh, the Victor Bout at the center of everything, the Jacques Monsieur, the, the, the Lords of War kind of character. Um, you know, and, and a lot of emphasis is on if we can control those bad guys, we can clamp down on the trade. Can you tell us a bit about how the broker works and what the real story looks like? Sure. Um, Nicholas Cage in Lords of War is not a typical broker. A uh, typical broker is a guy a bit like me, I guess, um, running or involved in a small import-export business operating out of a small industrial estate somewhere tucked away. Um, and, and this is the bread and butter of the trade. It's, it's not the big high-profile deals. It's maybe 20 rifles here, 30 submachine guns there. Um, and once a year, or, or two or three times a year from other brokers, you get a slice of somebody's shopping list, which, which might run to 150 weapons, or some ammunition, or weapons and ammunition. Mm. It's, it's, it's not super tankers or, or, or giant container ships stuffed full of tanks, rocket launchers, and, and other armored fighting vehicles. That's, that's not the business. So a smaller scale. And, and Sylvia, I mean, I'd be curious to hear a little bit from you um, about this issue of, of the illicit networks of small arms and then this interface with drugs. There's a lot of discussion these things go together, that often where you find drugs, you're going to find guns and vice versa, or other forms of contraband. So I'd be curious to hear in Mexico, in your experience, do these two things go together? Do we see drugs and guns being shipped together on Antonovs or Elishkins, or is it something different? How do you... Yeah, uh, guns, guns, drugs, and cash. You know, that's, that's the whole thing. However, they're always flowing in opposite directions. Uh, the drugs flow north, and the guns and the money come south. However, because of the dangerous nature of the drug trade, uh, the cartels have to kind of arm themselves to the teeth to protect themselves from the rivals, protect themselves against the police. Um, my perspective as a, as a professional is, is U.S.-based, and I work very closely with U.S. law enforcement to try to figure out what challenges they're facing from uh, drug activity on the border and, and beyond. And one of the problems that we're seeing on our side of the border is that the drug cartels are armed uh, more heavily than our own. I mean, American, powerful U.S. law enforcement, um, they have bulletproof vests that are, have more stopping power than U.S. law enforcement. Uh, they have weapons that have a higher caliber than U.S. law enforcement. So, you know, they need to be better prepared um, to deal with each other. And it's always who can outdo who. You know, we were talking a little bit um, backstage about some of the weapons that some of these groups are requiring. And you have cartels that are mounting anti-aircraft, or, you know, anti-aircraft, aircraft guns on top of pickup trucks, and they're not practical for use in the drug war. You know, some of this stuff, this military hardware, it's, it, this is urban warfare. So to use an, an RPG or, you know, a bazooka, or if they were able to get their hand on some kind of missile is pretty impractical, but a lot of it is show. It's a show of power. So anytime you're dealing with, you know, illegal drugs, you're dealing with huge volumes of cash, the cartels need to protect that. That is their, that's their lifeline, that is their cash cow. So in order to protect their territory from uh, rivals encroaching upon them, in order to protect themselves from uh, government forces, from the police uh, arresting them, apprehending them, um, they're required to arm themselves uh, very, very heavily with a variety of different uh, firearms. I'm going to give Akela one last uh, question, and it's basically what can technology do in a place like northern Uganda? We talked about the fourth world. We talked about access to SMS, MMS, to the Internet. What can technology do to, to sort of alleviate armed violence where you are? I think it's to demystify the, the idea of the, the fact that the perpetrators have more power than the victims. And, and I, I would like to see a moment when, when if someone is attacked, uh, there is a centralized system created that can reveal the perpetrators. That, that's, that's, because that really demystifies the concept that they are untouchable. Hmm. Sylvia, you got 30 seconds to tell me what can technology do in your part of the world to limit Be the illicit traffic? Sure. Um, because of that, uh, that lobby that I talked about, uh, you know, trying to keep track of weapons here in the United States is all done on paper. So the key is to make weapons detectable but not traceable to kind of keep everybody happy. Um, so maybe taking a look at uh, fingerprint recognition technology on weapons so that only the registered or legal user uh, of the guns could utilize them 
or somehow tagging all firearms with some kind of uh, chemical or metal that is detectable by some kind of detector at the border uh, so that certain guns can be flagged coming in uh, by the authorities without being able to actually trace them and violate anyone's uh, civil liberties or Second Amendment rights. So. Terrific. Ian, 20 seconds. 20 seconds. Um, I mentioned end user certificates, they're the key documents, but they're opaque. Once they've been issued and the transactions happened, they kind of disappear somewhere. Why could we not have them published in some place so that the public could examine the end user certificate and say that weapon serial number of that type was sold to that country on a specific date? And then if the weapon turns up somewhere else, somebody's got some explaining to do. Great. Look, thank you so much, all of you. You're excellent uh, panelists. I want to thank the, uh, you all for listening to us here. So, terrific. Exit stage left. Okay. My ass card. <laughs> terrific. Please welcome Peter Thome. Yeah, exactly. And booze. Okay. Well, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for your primary theme of the day is Hi. So, um, so how do you start to solve an impossible problem? Or a problem that most people think is impossible? And in this case, the problem is that there are millions of assault rifles in Africa at the center of conflict and disrupted development. And so that was our conundrum. And so what we decided that we had to decide from the beginning was that the problem wasn't impossible, it was just really hard. And that the solution, or a solution, probably wasn't obvious. But we knew that we would have to bring people along with us. And those people would have to get beyond their own sense of impossible. And to do that, we would have to create a transformation, to take things that were negative and make them positive, to move people intellectually and emotionally to a different place. And so we focused on the AK-47. And this became Fondry Calancet, Foundry 47. We remove AK-47s from conflict zones in Africa, and we transform them into a new essential material from which we make wearable art like our cufflinks that we make in Switzerland. They're made of, yellow, they're made of uh, rose gold, white gold, and our material. Each pair that is purchased funds the destruction of 100 assault rifles in Africa. They're issued in a limited and numbered series, and each piece bears the, the actual number of the gun that was destroyed, like all of our pieces. Here you can see them as a bracelet. Earrings made of gold and our material. When purchased, they fund the destruction of 500 guns in Africa. Rings made of gold and our material. Material treated in different ways, like you've seen before. When purchased, they fund the destruction of 75 guns in Africa. And we make these things with some of the finest designers and craftspeople in the world, like Roland Eden of Switzerland, Philip Crangy of New York, James de Givenchy of New York and Paris. And I'm happy to tell you that you're among the first people to know this, that we're actually making our first mechanical watch in Switzerland right now with one of the finest watchmakers in the world. But I think it's really important for you to know that this is not a project. We're building a brand to engage leaders, to change the way that people think and behave, 
and along the way to destroy lots of weapons. And this is possible because of two market-based things. The first is that when we destroy old, legacy, cheap weapons, we can shift the supply curve because of the pricing differentiation that you see on the screen right now. And second, the market or markets that we're entering are big, healthy, relatively stayed from a competitive perspective, and we are meaningfully different so that we can enter and differentiate. We launched this venture in November of last year, I'm happy to say to very positive acclaim. And this year, we're on track to hit all of the numbers that we've projected. We've destroyed 16,000 guns, or over 16,000 guns, in the Democratic Republic of Congo and Burundi so far. And we're on the verge of finishing our second capital round. So if I'm speaking to people in the audience who are investors, please come and see me afterward. If you would like to contact us, uh, whether you're here in the audience, you can talk to me later, but people who see this on video, you can contact us about collecting our pieces, donating to our not-for-profit organization, or contacting us about any, anything else that you want in these three ways. Thank you very much.